Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for Licensing Expo's second keynote of the event. This is called From Dream to Reality, The Power of Brand Licensing for Location-Based Entertainment. I'm Amanda Cialetti, Vice President of Content for the Global Licensing Group here at Informa, our show organizers. This keynote is to support our expo theme, which is location-based entertainment, which is a highly complex yet extremely rewarding um, set of licensing deals to execute. So joining us today to help walk us through kind of how you do this is a very informative panel, including Stacy Cohen, Senior Director of Global Branded Attractions for the NBA. Stacy brings location-based uh, entertainment to the millions of basketball fans around the world. We have Cecil Magpuri. He is the CEO of Falcons Beyond, which has helped many of the world's most iconic brands expand into new forms of entertainment that deepen connections with existing fans and attract millions around the world. We have Stacy Moscatelli. She is the co-president and chief strategy officer for Superfly X. Stacy has been instrumental in the development and expansion of the Friends Experience, the Office Experience, and um, which, all of which have been touring across various markets in the US and are on track to launch internationally next year. And lastly, we have Susan Vargo, head of live events and location-based experiences at Moonbug Entertainment. Susan is a recent addition to Moonbug and she's charged with building their live event and LBE experience. Um, prior to that, she spent 10 years managing uh, on and off-Broadway shows, as well as 18 years at Nickelodeon and Paramount in various LBE rules, roles across tours, stage adaptations, theme parks, resorts, and appearances. This panel is moderated by George Wade, president of Bay Laurel Advisors. George has been instrumental in bringing to life some of the biggest LBE experiences from Epcot Center to Tokyo Disneyland, Universal Studios Florida, and a wide range of products right here in Las Vegas. So please join me in welcoming our panel to the stage. Thank you so much, enjoy. Well, good afternoon to everybody and welcome to Licensing Expo and to our panel here. Uh, first of all, location-based entertainment. I know that some of you are asking yourself the question, what is location-based entertainment? And since we only have one hour, we're only going to be able to accomplish so much in doing that. But we have assembled here a panel of uh, experts in the field. And it's a very diverse panel from different parts of the industry. And what we're going to do is give you a sampler today. Uh, what we know that you, some of you are going to desire more information. And so the first thing I tell you is that location-based entertainment has a trade organization that focuses strictly on location-based entertainment called the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. And they have a website, iapa.org. And I would encourage you to go check out iapa.org to learn more about location-based entertainment. But with that, please, a round of applause for our panelists here. So let's go ahead and we'll get started here. The question, what is location-based entertainment? And Cecil, as a designer, you've had the opportunity to work on many different projects. How would you define location-based entertainment? Um, I'm going to get a little academic here. So I'm going to go reference wiki. <laughs> so the term location-based entertainment is used to describe entertainment experiences which takes place in locations outbound of the home and often associated with family entertainment centers, FECs, another acronym. Um, so with that description, you can obviously tell that that means a lot, right? There's such a broad range of entertainment experiences that are outbound of the home. Um, you know, one of the things that I was involved with early on when I was at iWorks Entertainment, we were developing LBEs in the 90s. So the word LBE has been around for a long time, decades. But it's now coming back in the forefront because there's these waves of opportunities where there's new drive for outside entertainment that's challenging the in-home entertainment. Back then, it was the fidelity of DVDs, um, the home theater was a big deal, and we wrote an article in Cineworks, which was our trade magazine at iWorks, about LBEs. And it's, it's funny to see that acronym come back and be relevant today. Um, I think it's relevant today because there's new things that are challenging. Um, you know, the game industry in home, um, SVOD and AVOD, you know, are 
stealing the outside entertainment. So some of the experiences that we did back in the 90s was projects like Cinetropolis, you may be familiar with. We did that in Foxwoods, Connecticut, and in Japan. Other LBEs that were in the 90s was the Sony Metreon. City Walk was realized in that time period. Mono retail experiences like the Nike experience in Manhattan. And then there was the array of themed restaurants that happened to be LBEs as well, like the Rainforest Cafe. So that was 30 years ago. So we find that there's this rep repetitive um, uh, exposure to LBEs coming into, in every decade. And there's this new wave of LBEs that are in the marketplace and continues to be relevant. Um, some of these you may be familiar with. Um, Urban Air, the Crayola experience, the Friends experience, the Void, Van Gogh immersion, Area 15, Meow Wolf, 2-Bit Circus, and one that we were involved with is the National Geographic experience, Ocean Odyssey in, in Manhattan. But the list goes on. So. so, And CISO, I think one thought that comes to mind is the fact that it seems today the consumer is much more focused on experiences than they are on products. Would you agree with that? Definitely, definitely. S Susan? Yeah, I think that the experience economy, which we were talking a lot about pre-COVID, has really started to roar back as people think about how to spend time together as a family, how to spend time together outside of the home. I think certainly we're all ready for that. We're all ready to be back together in a, in a communal experience here. Just look at us. So. We've now had the educational portion of our programming here. Uh, I don't know if Amanda told you, there will be quizzes handed out at the end of the session. So we hope you are all paying attention to CISO there. Um, we know that most of you are here focused on the brand licensing aspect. And a lot of people, you can license brands into location-based entertainment. And that's what our panel here is going to focus on is, is the how can brands license into the sector as well as what are some of the issues that they need to take into account if they're going into brand licensing. So first of all, Susan, why do you think major entertainment brands are so important to LBE operators? Well, I, I think what Cecil was saying about the operators being in the business for such a long time that they know their customers and their consumers. And I think brands have discovered that that's where those customers and consumers are. So as operators are looking for new ways to bring new people in the door, the synergy between signing up a brand becomes kind of a shorthand for them for what they stand for. And obviously everyone's looking to increase revenue. So if an operator can increase revenue and repeatability by partnering with a brand to bring people in, then that brand can also have an untapped, potentially consumer base to increase their heart share and their awareness and obviously create an ancillary revenue and income stream. And Stacey Cohen, when you were at Mattel, did you see this as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at Mattel, we absolutely saw it. You know, you're reaching kids who just have this huge affinity for specific properties. Um, sports brands, the NBA in particular, are unique in this situation because our ultimate fan experience is our live games. But out of hundreds of millions of fans around the world, less than 1% actually get to go to the live games. So you have audiences around the world that span a really wide demographic that are hungry and craving experiences for the brand. And the league is always creating unique touch points to reach those fans. So for operators, you have this huge demographic. It's truly a win-win situation. Now, Stacy Moscatelli is actually a brand licensee. However, you're not allowed to all tackle her as she leaves the, uh, the arena here, OK? Stacy, you have licensed brands. Why don't you talk about why Superfly has focused on entertainment brands and how you've targeted some of those brands? Sure. So, you know, like we were saying, what a brand brings to the table for location-based is this built-in fandom that you can tap, that you can leverage. And so, you know, bringing in uh, a known IP with a known audience base and engaging them in a new way, creating that brand extension is, is great. It's really powerful for, for both sides of the equation, right? For the licensor and for the licensee. And so, you know, tapping into that audience base, delivering on what their expectation would be to see that experience come to life 
life in the real world is, you know, is pretty critical. But, but I think um, something that fans really want to see right now is how do they engage with those brands off the screen and how do they engage with them in real life? And I think, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do because there is a built-in fan expectation. But I think, you know, it, it, it's really important that you, that you have the ability to tap that audience, that known audience who knows the brand already. You're not starting from zero. When you launched the Friends Experience, that was done under license from Warner Brothers, and they were in the middle of their 25th anniversary of Friends that year, and that really helped to spur you know, the interest in the actual pop-up experience, correct? Yeah, it, it's always a great opportunity when we can tap into some sort of key moment for the, for the brand, right? Whether that's an anniversary, a new film coming out, some sort of big tentpole moment that we can rally around because that's when you've got, you know, the, the highest engagement from the fan base and to be able to leverage that and pull them into an experience and have them engage deeper, you know, is always a win. And I'm going to, just going to take a moment for a cheap uh, plug here. If you happen to be in New York City, go visit the Friends Experience, okay? <laughs> Um, and I, I will share this also, you know, I had one of those experiences myself, but I had it from a vendor who was selling an experience, in this case, motion simulation theaters, when CISO and I were at iWorks Entertainment. Uh, we were doing generic simulation films. And I suggested to the leadership, let's do a branded simulation film. It's going to allow our client, the operator, to be able to market the brand instead of trying to explain motion simulation. So we licensed Robocop from Orion Pictures, and we were able to sell six simulation systems even before the movie was ready to be released in the, the simulation theaters, just being able to give a marketing commitment to our clients that said, here's your marketing campaign, Robocop the Ride, end. And it worked very well. So that's just another example of that. So, CISO. How do brands help with the development of great guest experience? Because at the end of the day, it's about the experience. Yeah, it's interesting to think about how intellectual property gets in this lane of LBE. Um, obviously, there's LBEs that are out there that are bespoke and have their own IPs, right? Not all LBEs are um, leveraging existing IPs. There's ones that are already, you know, like some of the ones I've, I've mentioned. But if you are embracing uh, the LBE lane for your IPs, some of the challenges is, you know, what is it going to be? You know, there's all these different types of immersion experiences that are out there. What's the right one for your IP? So you need to kind of be an IP whisperer, if you will. And you mentioned IAPA, you know, there's a lot of design firms like Falcons that are in the industry that really do this for a living to try to interpret the tenets of each IP and try to sculpt a vision be behind that IP and look at how it translates into the brick and mortar. And it might not be what you think the guest wants. You know, sometimes it's something different. Um, it's not always what the guest is right in some cases. It could be different than what you anticipate. So there's a, a huge part of the creative process that is involved in interpreting the IPs into the brick and mortar world. And so having the right team and resources is a key part of the success of that. Okay, so see, so you've approached it from the design side. Stacy Moscatelli, you've done it from the operator side. How did your designers and how did the brand really help in bringing friends and the office to life for you? How did the brand really play into it in both those cases? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a critical partnership, right? And I think that what our licensors bring is that they know the brands very, very well. They know the audience very, very well. And I think that when they bring a partner like us on, we help them think about it in ways they haven't thought about it before. And so the marriage of those two, of the two of us coming together is, to your point, what I think, you know, surprises the fans. Um, it delivers on the expectation, but it also brings them something they've not seen before. So I think that's the, the perfect marriage. Susan, you were actually on the brand side of having to support your licensees. What were, the, what were the, the challenges that you saw and how did you support your licensees as a brand at Nickelodeon? Uh, well, I think that that expectation management is really, really important. <clears throat> and it's important not just from a partnership standpoint, whether it's the licensee or the operator, but it's also the consumer. Um, I think these kinds of LBEs really work when you take something and adapt it or interpret it for the new media that it's going into. Um, it's not a logo slap or something that doesn't feel authentic with the DNA of 
uh, the, the brands or the IPs. I mean, at, at Nickelodeon, we had a really incredible team of, of experienced designers who lived and breathed theme parks and attractions and live theatricals and experiences. And it was a very, it's a very specific design segment. And we have a whole team that, that supported that. But we do, we did also look towards our, our partners who also are experts in their fields. And I, and I have to say that that's one of the things that we do look at when we're identifying who is the partner to work, work with as a brand. You know, you want the partner who has experience in the market, that has the, the breadth and the marketing experience, but also Cecil talks about being a, a brand whisperer and a brand guardian. We would deeply onboard our partners because they are the front line I I interacting with a consumer. We're not, we're not there once we enter into that partnership. So it's important that our brand is as important to them as it is to us. And when it came to things like approval processes and things of that nature, how did you work with the designers to be able to execute those approvals? Because I'm sure you didn't just expect they're going to deliver these designs, you're going to look at them and say, okay, yeah, these are great, let's move on. Well, it depends which partner you ask. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Um, I, I think what's really, really important is from the very beginning of the project, you're all talking about the same outcome. So having a, a mission statement for what you're trying to actually bring to the table so that everyone is talking about the same thing, the same piece of content that you're then going to market, because that will go through all of the different stages of the process, and you have something to match your approvals against. So I think that, again, that initial expectation management of what are we really trying to do and how are we going to get that across the finish line and deliver that to the fans. You know, and you use the word partnership, and I think that's a great word, that uh, it's a licensor, licensee relationship, but at the end of the day, to create the guest experience, it needs to be a partnership. Would you agree? Oh, definitely, definitely. I think, Stacey, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, sometimes these... Some, most fans actually know your brand probably even more than you do. So that authenticity is crucial. And while the approval process is sometimes arduous, the checks and balances that it provides, um, and all those minute details, I mean, making sure the right Pantone color is there, which I'm sure is a conversation we've all had when matching fabrics, et cetera. Um, the fans understand, they expect it from you, and they understand that detail, and it, it is absolutely important to deliver that to them, um, because they'll catch you on it, and you don't want to be caught. Um, Location-based experiences have the opportunity to deliver a lifetime value fan, um, to truly engage your fan, but there's a risk there. So the risk is, if they don't believe they receive an authentic experience, you could actually turn a fan away. So that authentic experience is the difference between developing a lifelong fan or turning them away from your brand. I'm going to want to come back to that word authenticity in a minute, but you've had the opportunity to um, help develop experiential licensing programs for two different companies, with Mattel and now with the NBA. You know, what are some of the key steps and strategies that you think are critical to establishing an LBE program? To me, the first step is knowing that fan. So understanding your fan, doing a lot of research, and your fan, their wants and desires vary by market and by age demographic. So the younger fans who are actively playing basketball want a very different experience than our 34 to 55 year old segment who grew up with through some of the favorite championships of players. They want a more historical story driven experience than the younger fans who want hands on active play experiences. So doing the complex research to understand each of those fan segments and creating experiences that are specific to what they want um, is to me is the first step. The next step is corporate objectives. So most of us are in this to make money. Um, so creating new revenue streams is the first consideration, but there's so much extra value that comes from branded experiences, driving Halo product growth, driving to retail sales, subscribers, collecting names for email databases, establishing yourself in international markets, the list goes on. So really understanding what your corporation objectives are, which target markets they wanna reach, which locations. Um, and then marrying that up to what you're creating and how you're creating it. If you're looking at what the current trends are, you're already behind. Location-based entertainment deals take way too long than all of us would like to admit. So looking at what's next and how are you stretching that brand? I think Stacy had mentioned, like you're, you're taking the brand to places it really hasn't been. So looking at how you're gonna stretch your brand. Um, but at the forefront of all of that is operations. So finding partners, design partners who are designing with operations at the forefront and in mind the whole time. Don't just design this amazing, beautiful experience 
design it for repeatability, design it for visitation, design it so that everybody um, can leave saying, yeah, that, that was worth it. That was my, I received a value for money. I, I received something from the brand. You just used a word that I want to follow up on, and Stacey Moscatelli, I'd love for you to touch on this. Repeatability. As an operator, how critical is repeatability to you? It, it, highly critical. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for a brand like Friends, what's great is that, you know, Friends isn't going out of style. It's 28 years old at this point. Um, but that said, how are we refreshing the experience? How are we thinking about creating opportunities for fans to engage as much as they want to? And so, you know, what are seasonal overlays? What are some programming that we can do in the space? How do we sort of create an opportunity to bring fans back and a reason to come back? And so, you know, that's something that you don't just open the doors and walk away. It's something that you really need to think about, you know, um, from an experiential, what is my tentpole strategy and how am I thinking about those opportunities, whether it's through, you know, stunts, contests. We've had some fun, you know, weddings and, and things like that happen in the friends experience. And so it's like, how do you give people a reason to come back? You have had weddings at the friends experience. <laughs> yes, we've had weddings. We have had about 80 proposals happen in the friends experience. We've had at least a couple of proposals happen at the office experience. But, you know, this isn't necessarily the topic, but I think you've got these beloved brands that people, they, they truly love so much that you really, they'll, they'll take as much as you'll give. So I think it's really about thinking about how do you create that opportunity? How do you celebrate those moments with them? And, you know, how do you bring it back? But once, you know, one proposal happened, the floodgates opened. I mean, please tell me they actually reenacted the proposals from this series. All yeses so far. All Amazing. yeses. Shameless plug number two, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, you can visit the Friends Experience there as well. And soon the Office Experience. In and the Office Experience, too. Have you had proposals in the office? We've had a couple, yeah. Have you? Yeah. Bizarrely in front of the that's what she said wall. And Susan, you've had the opportunity. It, it, it sounds like this is more, I thought it was easy to do a licensing program. It's not? It's probably easier to propose than it is to do, <laughs> to do a licensing deal. I mean, I think one of the things we haven't really talked about at all is the amount of money involved from uh, you know, the, the, the investment that our partners put in place when they take on board our brands and the in repeated investment to refresh and to keep things um, exciting for our fans. And so they, these can often be very long-term, highly capital intensive, long tail deals. If we have a brand that has so much resonance, some of these deals are in market 10, 15, 20 years. And so they're, they're highly complicated. And it's not just the, the, the ticket revenue at the door. There's sponsorship elements. There's merchandise elements. There are are ways to create an entirely new brand experience through a merchandised element. So, yeah, they, they can take a while to get the deals done, that's for sure. Okay, so now you've told us the, the biggest challenges, but I think one of the big benefits of good location-based entertainment projects is that once you have them open, they're almost like long-term gifts that keep on giving, right? Yeah, yeah. They, yes. It can definitely be a nice pension plan, I think, if you get something that's really, really hits and, and is successful and is replicatable. I think that's, you know, what, what we would all love is to have a blueprint for something that really resonates with our, with our fans and, and it may start in one city and then it goes everywhere and it goes global. Um, but the first one is, the first one always has a little teething problems to get it across the finish line. All right, we're going to pivot for just a second here. Back to you, CISO. Let's talk about some of the key attributes for a location-based entertainment project. You just went through a mall, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. No. CISO, thanks for stopping by, <laughs> we you. really appreciate it. Thank you very it. much, and good night. No. Um, LBs are audience builders. You know, obviously that's a positive thing for any IP. Um, they can help establish new IP offerings you know, with these new immersive experiences. Um, one of the key features is the repeatability. I think that's an important part. Obviously, there's been LBEs that don't focus on that component, so there are good and bad LBEs. So again, back to the IP whisperer and also the needs of what you're, I mean, the tenets of what you want out of an LB is important, but obviously a feature is repeatability, right? That continues to have your brand aware uh, to consumers. And so that also, it, that exposure helps build your audience. Um, today's LBEs now can be realized with sophistication and new technologies. I think that's something the LBEs of today has an advantage of. They can enhance the guest experience for um, new fans, 
and existing fans as well to engage even deeper, uh, allowing them to have themselves have agency. I think that's another key layer that LBs give instead of watching content on just uh, television or interacting on one component, you can actually give guests agency and have a control over their own destiny within the realms of that IP. I think that's another positive. So now you're building community and agency that's new offerings that guests are looking for. And I think expectations for guests today, I know we talked a little bit about the experience economy, but now it's like the demand of, uh, of, of quality content is out there too. And relevance and quality and agency. So these are attributes of an LBE if done right. One of the attributes that, uh, Stacy, you brought up just a minute ago with authenticity, how did you tackle that when both when you were at Mattel and at the NBA? There are definitely moments in your career where you're, you know, you're saying, get the Barbie hairstylist on the flight tomorrow, or you know, tuck in that jersey or we'll never be able to use these photos. And, and there's these little nuances. And you're like, how do, I even, how do I even have this knowledge in my head? Um, but you accumulate it. And um, as Susan was saying, you pass that on to your brand partners also. And um, those little details are truly what gets picked up by the fan. Um, so learning your brand, doing a, a really immersive, um, kick off with your partners and then checking it throughout um, and, and continuing to continually learning from your fans too. Um, when I worked on Thomas the Tank Engine, you know, they would notice if one, there's, you know, a few hundred trains and characters, and they would notice if one was missing. So learning from the fans and, and, and really listening to them and recreating your experiences based on what they're looking for from your brand um, creates, continually creates it to be authentic. The guest feedback is really critical to helping keep you honest. Yes, absolutely. CISO for the authenticity question. You know, we've worked in for a couple of decades taking IPs and transforming them into brick and mortar. And it's interesting the word authenticity because a lot of the experiences that we're doing are contrived content. They're not like historical authentic. So the word authentic is really you interpret how you take the tenets of that IP, regardless of what medium it is, and try to execute that as true to the brand as possible within the brick and mortar. So I think that's the word authenticity when it comes from a design standpoint is really understanding, doing the deep dive and understanding the tenets of that IP and looking at how that translates into this different medium, if you will. And Stacy Moscatelli is an operator. You had to work with Warner Brothers on Friends, NBC, uh, on The Office. You know, what were the challenges of meeting those expectations as the company was actually producing these experiences? I mean, we're obviously really lucky because we're working with two really popular brands. And, you know, for us, it's about assembling a team of fans to create the experience and making sure that they're coming from a place of being, you know, highly immersed. So for us, you know, we, how many times have you seen Friends? We rewatched it from top to bottom. We talked about it. You know, we talked about our favorite moments. What, what were the key themes? What are the things that we want to bring to life? And so I think that that immersion is, is, is just critical. Um, and even though you think you're a fan, I think you need to also talk to fans, as Stacey, the other Stacy said, um, and really understand, you know, what's important to them. And I think um, if you start with what will, what do the fans want out of this and start with them, you, you hopefully can't go wrong. Got it. All right. So I'm now going to each you ask the same question. I'd love to get your take on it. What is one unique factor or challenge that you really feel is important to take into account when developing a licensing program for location-based entertainment? Stacy Cohen. For me, um, value for money is, is the most important. So a lot of times we try to create these one-size-fits-all experiences to get as many people through the door as possible, sometimes charging them as much as we can just to make that operating profit. But what you end up doing is delivering a 50% experience to a whole bunch of fans. Rather than curating your experience, as I was talking about before, creating them for a smaller group of fans, but delivering the ultimate 100% experience to them. Letting them walk away saying that was worth every penny, I would pay that again or I would even pay more, is, is the factor to really consider, is what is that value that they're getting from their brand experience. Susan? I, I think that the, the one unique opportunity is to make a marriage, I think you were talking about a marriage, make a marriage between the right brand or IP and the right application. And to really be creatively considered in how something shows up in the real world. Because then, if it's the right match, the DNA of the brand will show up in the right way and it won't feel mis mismatched. And I think that's probably the, there's a, there is, in, there is, 
experiences are popping up everywhere to different degrees of success. And so just to be in the market, to be in the market, I would say hesitate to make that commitment. Cecil. She took my answer. I just want to be very clear. No, um, I think, again, I, I mentioned this before, it's having the right team <laughs> to execute, right? I mean, when you, um, you know, we've seen being on the server side and doing designs, you know, being hired by a developer who has the capital and has a location in a different country and have us try to secure IP, you know, we've done that. And so all of a sudden we play this role between both the IP provider and the developer, and sometimes those don't align, you know. So we have, in between those two um, resources, we have to play mediator and oftentimes have to convince the developer to spend more money to get the right fidelity for the IP or tell the IP, look, you're overreaching. So finding the right team and developer, you know, who, who you're licensing to is key. Because if they're not aligned, then it's not going to be successful. It's going to be a challenge. So. I'm going to pivot the question for you, Stacey Moscatelli, just a little bit. As an operator, what is the biggest factor that you want to see from a brand? Oh, gosh. I think, you know, I think the big thing, and, and Susan touched on this, is that it takes time, right? You can't rush the process if you want to get it right, especially when you're working with an existing brand and an existing fan base. And so I think it, you know, if you, really put the time in at the front end to align on you know, the principles, on the goals, why we're all here, what we want to get out of this, and what we want to achieve. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all challenging. This is a challenging business. It is not for the faint of heart. It is hard, and it takes time and effort, and you're, it's always on. You don't open the doors and go to sleep and go on vacation. You open the doors, and you take on a whole new set of challenges, whether that's COVID, whether that's, you know, any factor, weather, whatever that is. And so I think that you know what you want from a brand is you want a partner and you want someone who understands that this is, is hard and that things will come up. You know, no no partner, no vendor can get it right the first time. And so what you want is to have a relationship that when the tough things come up, you can have a really good, smart discussion about it and make decisions quickly um, because those things will happen and it will come up. And so I think it, it is about that relationship and about making sure that you have that alignment early on so that when you get to those hard things, because you will, it's, you, you can solve them together. Oh, one of the things um, that I always tell our team is that you, know, you spend months and sometimes years negotiating an agreement um, and you're negotiating it. The second that agreement is signed, you guys are on one team. You no longer work for the NBA or work for Falcons. You guys work for one team, one project, one team on one project opening that. Um, so, it, so it's a unique experience because you're, you're all of a sudden pulled out of your corporate role and becoming a designer and becoming a marketer and, and, and kind of integrating all these facets of experiences. In essence, your client now becomes the guest. Absolutely. <laughs> right. And one thing I do want to say is that we hear all the challenges here. And if you're a brand who's new to LBE, you might say, oh my God, this sounds like way too much work. And as they said, it's not easy. But I will tell you, there's a reason why most of the, every of the major entertainment companies now has a team dedicated to location-based licensing because there are many benefits to a really good location-based licensing program from a marketing standpoint, from a revenue standpoint, from growing brands. So I just wanted to... You know, we, we focus on all the challenges because we get to live them all the time, but there's so many great benefits that come along with it. Uh, if I can add to that, I think you, you, you see it in a lot of the big theme parks. You know, these IPs become evergreen. I mean, the LBE, the brick and mortar, can actually have your IP become evergreen. I think that's a, a huge attribute for an IP. All right, so we're going to have one final question here, and the question is going to be, if you had to select one branded project, and CISO, I know you've said it before. 32. I have 32 favorite ones. It'll take a couple of hours. <laughs> and, you guys are and patient you enough. Can, you can visit the Falcons booth, and CISO will introduce you to all 32 of them. <laughs> but if CISO once said to me, he said, come on, don't ask me to try to select who's my favorite child. But we're going to do it anyway. If you had one project, what is, your fa you know, what is one that really stands out to you? And I'm going to go ahead and go first. I've had the opportunity to work with Crayola on the development and the execution of five different Crayola experiences. We did the first one that opened in uh, spring of 2013. We've now done four more over the past nine years. 
And to watch children playing in a creative atmosphere is so heartwarming and just brings such joy. And to this day, it will, it, it will rank forever as one of my all-time favorite projects. Stacy. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be able to pick, um, but I, I have two moments that really stand out to me in my career. The first is um, a little bit to what you're talking about. Blood, sweat, and tears go into these experiences, and, and oftentimes actual blood, sweat, and tears as you're on site wrapping things up and getting things open. The, the moment those doors open and the first public, not your PR guest, but the first public guest walks through the experience, um, the aha moment, not, not much beats that. Um, the second moment for me is you build these, as he's was saying, you build these to last, um, to last sometimes decades. Um, and you know, some of the experiences that I've built, children's museum exhibits or stage shows were built before I even met my husband, but definitely before I had kids on my mind. And getting to bring my daughter through those and seeing like, I rewrote that script or I put that clock there and, and you know, created that activity and getting um, her engagement on that, um, that. God, that's the best thing ever. <laughs> Susan. Well, I'm, I'm going to say all my upcoming projects with Falcons, as we just announced earlier in the week. Um, but besides that, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think I have to say the SpongeBob musical Susan, on Broadway. Susan, no pandering, okay? What? No pandering, okay? <laughs> they sat in the front row. What are you going to do? Um, I'd have to say uh, the SpongeBob musical at Nickelodeon, which took 13 years of my life um, and was probably my third child. But it was a, it was a project that was extremely risky to the, to the brand, and we were instructed very much from the beginning that there had to be an interesting creative way in, or it wasn't worth doing. And I, I think I'm so proud of what we ended up putting on stage, not just for the commercial space, but it's being produced in, I think, hundreds of schools and introducing children to theater across the country. And so for the theater nerd in me, it's, that has to be the one. Well, I am going to talk about Falcon Central because that is my favorite one, the one we're working on now. Um, we're going to be realizing that in uh, the end of uh, 2023, uh, early 24. It's a retail dining and entertainment zone called Falcon Central, which will house four major LBE experiences, one of which is Curiosity Playground, which will showcase Moonbug Entertainment's Coco Melon and Blippi. So that is my favorite one. And now, Stacy, it truly is you picking which is your favorite child. But if you had to really talk about one project right now, which one would you want to talk about? I love all of my kids. I know you e do. Equally. Too bad. Um, Pick one. We, we have a, a project, actually, that we have not yet announced that we're days away from announcing um, that we've been working on for a really long time with our partner, with, with a few partners. And... Um, it's just, it, it's, it's different than what we've ever done. And I think, you know, I, I can't talk about it, unfortunately, much to my chagrin. My stars did not align to announce it yet. Um, but, you know, that one is really special. I mean, that said, you know, friends and having people propose and have, you know, one of the most special moments of their lives happen in the space um, never ceases to amaze me. So I think that that's a really special one. Um, so, you know, in the office. <laughs> When you walk around the corner and see Pam's desk You're and you hear now. people, I know, I know. But it's hard. They're all great, right? And I think what it is is like they're all different. And so I think, you know, they're all unique. They're all custom. They all take a lot of time and effort. And so you, you do love them all in different ways. So can I talk about my 32 now? <laughs> At your booth. 31. 31. At your booth. What, what's the booth number, Cecil? You what? 188. You 188 if you want to hear about all of Cecil's 32 projects. So... Um, before we go to questions, I just want to just add a little bit more flavor here. First of all, you heard some key words here. Authenticity is critical. Repeatability is critical. And I want to circle back to the fact that today's consumer is as much or more interested in experiences as they are in products. Uh, ICSC, the big shopping center uh, trade association, they did a study in uh, late 2019 that said that one third of every dollar spent in a shopping mall was being spent on experiences, be it movies, going out to dinner, traditional entertainment experiences, health and wellness, health clubs, things you couldn't carry out in a bag. And when I talked to someone from ICSC late last year, I said, okay, it was 33%, what is it now? He said, we haven't done the research, but it's definitely much higher. So it's something for you to keep in mind. This is where our consumer is going. Let's try to meet them and fulfill on their expectations. 
Uh, some people might have interest in additional information about location-based entertainment. So if you want to learn more, there are three uh, publications I'd, I'd recommend that you check out online. Fun World Magazine is the official magazine of IAPA. Uh, and if you're a non-member, I've been told you're able to access the current issue every month online. Wonderful stories, wonderful resources about location-based entertainment. The second, Blue Loop, is an online publication uh, generated out of Europe. Uh, and then the third, who I've had the opportunity to do a lot of work with, is In Park Magazine, who has both a published hard copy magazine as well as their online portal. And again, a great cross-section of articles about location-based entertainment. Finally, if you really want to do some in-depth research, In Park has started a podcast series. There are over 30 different podcasts now. I had the opportunity to do one for them on brand licensing late last year. It's called In Tracks you can uh, access it from the InPark website. So with that being said, uh, any questions? Th thank you. My, my question is, excuse me, my question is, is there, in terms of traveling or pop-up branded opportunities, do those exist? Stacy? Yes, they do. <laughs> um, you know, I think that uh, touring is kind of a critical component of any location-based strategy. Um, the reason I think that is that it is the most accessible to fans geographically, financially. So I think as you think about, you know, I always describe it as, you know, any, any brand should have a location-based ecosystem and touring and pop-up should be a component of that. Um, and I think, you know, with that, you should really think about how that complements everything else that you do because it covers a lot of ground and reaches a lot of fans. I can just add to that a little bit. So there's two benefits from the brand side to traveling experiences. One is um, that buzz to get it in that moment. So traveling experiences, you, you know, most of us, and this is probably an industry secret, but you only announce up to three months. And then you extend it an extra month and it's a bonus and you can get in that month and, and you're driving that uh, urgency to purchase ticket sales. So that buzz is really valuable to brands. Extended by popular demand. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, even though that was the plan the whole time. Um, the second is um, you get to test different markets. So, you know, with a global brand such as the NBA, we, we know where our fans are, but we don't know what exactly they're looking to receive. And, and it, it helps to that data collection that I was mentioning earlier, is, is throwing these experiences in a market for you know, a few months gives us enough data to then generate a more permanent-based experience um, based on what we receive from the fans during those temporary experiences. Got it. Next question. Hi there. Um, just uh, for, for, for people who are just starting out, um, what would you guys suggest that someone, like a licensee, put in their proposal to a licensor to get, get it approved, get their uh, event approved? Having had the opportunity to work on both sides of that equation, I'd share with you. The first thing that you need to do is have developed your creative far enough along that the licensor can understand what it is you would like to do with their brand. Secondly, be able to show the economic viability of that project, okay? Um, you know, a licensor is not going to want to do a project unless they see that it, you know, the most important factor, great guest experience. Second most important factor, it must be a success. You have to be able to show that roadmap to that uh, financial success for you as an operator and therefore for them. So you start with a great idea, financial viability, and then you need to make sure that you can explain, this is how we're going to execute it. Give them the comfort factor that you, you, you know what you're doing, that you have the, um, uh, uh, the, te you know, the team who has credibility, and to be able to show that game plan that's going to be able to get to the finish line. Susan, do you have, you've had the opportunity to work on this from a lot of different standpoints. What did you look for from a potential licensee when you were at Nickelodeon? I think an understanding of the brand and our consumers, right? So how are you going to deliver something to our consumers in this business segment that we're, we're not serving them otherwise? I think it was interesting to hear Stacy talk about it as an LBE ecosystem. There, there, don't, there is a large tiered group 
of, of different right-sized experiences from theme parks to resorts to destinations to mall shows to restaurant concepts. And I think being able to say, I have this specific expertise and I want to deliver your brand for these reasons uh, within the context of a viable business plan is, is really what we're looking for. All right, everybody, we didn't do that good a job now. Well, oh, we have one more. Oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I'm building a strategy for a brand uh, that uh, I plan for 10 or 15 years. What are the top factors? that uh, can make you halfway change direction. Um, maybe uh, consumer analytics or uh, maybe the brand themselves are re-strategizing. What are the top factors that can make you go in a different direction with your go-to-market strategy? Stacy, why don't you lead us off here? I learned this from um, intern interviewing interns, but one of our um, interns had said, that she was tasked with finding viral material. And she kept submitting something and it wasn't resonating and it wasn't getting posted. And she was like, what am I missing? And her, her vision of what would go viral, she was a sports enthusiast. So she kept thinking, okay, it has to be like the most ultimate sports moment. But truly, you were looking for those funny moments that people start laughing and that's what they share. Um, I, I think when you're looking at what's gonna be popular long term, we don't know what's gonna catch on. And it varies, all of us may have a different opinion of what's gonna be viral or trending. And, and I think most of us, um, when the van goes and those immersive experiences popped up, most of them are like, what, how did we, how did we not think of this? And, and you're, you say that often, um, it, it's important to pivot quickly, um, it's important to know what your brand is and where your brand is going, and then to, to try to think about what's not been done and what resonates with you and then um, polling your fans. What's gonna resonate with them now? Um, and, and what are you putting out there for them to resonate with in the future? But I, I think ultimately, some things hit and some things don't. Um, and it's important to just uh, you know, stay true to yourself and, and keep trying to get ahead of it. You know, one of our clients is Crayola. And what Crayola has done is, you know, they put together a roadmap. And that roadmap served as the guide for the program. But it was also when new opportunities presented themselves or when we were seeing new trends, we knew that we might be stepping away from our roadmap, but it helped us to also keep track of where we were going. And we can always change the roadmap, right? Uh, factors that play into it, technology. Technology is changing so quickly. Uh, and there's sometimes we see technology like virtual reality had uh, a period of time where it was, you know, the, the the buzzword that everyone was talking about in location-based entertainment. Unfortunately, no one could figure out what was the business model that would return profitability on virtual reality, right? But now we're seeing augmented reality and see, so we're seeing other technologies come to the forefront that brands have to be ready to pivot with. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you start to look at some technologies that are consumer-facing, you think that it could be a great asset for an LBE, but in reality, it has to be purposeful, right? So you really need to know what your IP, what the goals are, instead of look at what new hot technology is out there and try to apply it. You know, it's like slapping a brand on a roller coaster. It's not intended to be deep, you know? So um, yeah, there's lots of different technologies. I think I talked a little bit about agency. It, it's understanding the community and what they're looking for. Um, deeper immersion, memorable camaraderie and community. Those are attributes that technology is allowing us to use. So technology should be ubiquitous to the experience. It's not about the technology. It's how you use the technology to connect people. You know, so ultimately, I think that's where technology plays. So the last thing I would say to your question is that it's important to have people who are working with you at the brand who understand location-based entertainment are able to be in communication with the operators because the operators, they'll have a, a good uh, pulse of what their guest is looking for. Some of the operators are not able to pivot as quickly as they might like uh, because of the way their operation is built. But then you have companies like Superfly who because of being in the you know, Turing business, 
it allows you to be able to pivot. It, it, would you agree on that, Stacey? Yeah, absolutely. You know, even if you think about the past three years, location, it, there's been an evolution. And I think, you know, with that, we've all evolved too. And I think, you know, to Georgia's point, you want to have a roadmap, but you want to have flexibility because you want to adapt as the audience adapts. Any other questions? Hello. Hi, how are you? Um, quick question for you in regard to your uh, LBEs and concerns if something goes wrong, like while it's in happening in, the, in progress, like do you have backup plans, do you have like assets allocated if something goes wrong, other brand ideas to take place of something else if something just falls apart. <laughs> Basically, uh, yeah, to cover anything, red mistakes or problems occur at the moment where you have to kind of like fix an area. It's kind of like if a ride breaks, you have another ride to take its place to kind of I guess, take over for that spot. Thank you. The real work starts the day it opens. <laughs> yeah. Stacy yeah. Moscatelli, you yeah. get to live this daily. You Why know, don't you tackle it first? I, those things w will happen. And I think, you know, it's about having a plan. It's about having experience. And it's about, you know, being able to be decisive and again you know having that partnership because as a licensor you and the brand have to make decisions about how to deal with those situations together at least you know at the, at the highest level you know sometimes it might be there's a snowstorm or the power went out you know there, there's always something that's going to happen but I think it's about you know uh, having that plan and having an experienced team that knows how to calmly deal with what what will can and will come up and I had mentioned earlier how the, the brand will be looking at how is your operation set up uh, and um, you know, who are the people that are behind it. And part of it is being able to react quickly, pivot, and be able to communicate with the guest. If something goes wrong, be able to communicate and be able to take care of the guest's concerns. Hear their concern, address it. If it's something that's a big deal, you just have to be out front of it because things happen in life. And so, good, clear, concise communication then becomes a key from an operational standpoint. Yeah, and I always say as much as possible, get in a room and talk about anything that could possibly happen and figure out if and when this happens, who, who owns it and, and what's your plan. And there'll be something you did not think about, you did not talk about. But, you know, if you can knock out 20 of those things so that when they happen, you know, sort of, okay, we already talked about this, you're in a really great place. If you've talked about none of those things, you're going to be ill prepared. So I think it really is, you know, sitting in a room and figuring out, you know, any, there could be a flood, there, the light could, you know, seriously, whatever it is, it's like, it, it, it will all happen at some point in time. It has all happened to all of us at some point in time. So I think it, it really is about playing all those scenarios out and at least at a minimum knowing who on the team is responsible and accountable for reacting to, to that situation. I think we have time for one more. Thank you guys for taking the time. Um, just curious, um, you spoke on technology. Uh, what are your thoughts on PO apps and um, digital um, say collectibles or something to identify that you are actually at an event moving forward, especially with an LBE, um, just as a fan personally. I mean, it's, it's definitely, a, there's not many conversations that happen in the NBA without the metaverse being mentioned or NFTs being mentioned. And um, I have to Google it almost every time it is mentioned. Um, but I think for us, NFTs are actually becoming experiential. So during our All-Star Weekend, what we did is we had NFTs that you could enter to win a chance to win tickets to the fi next five All-Star Games. So it's not just about owning a piece of digital content, it's now about a piece of owning either history or owning a future experience. And I think for integrating that into live experience, it's how do you gain access um, or create a membership or create challenges within the experience um, that end up being collectible or you know end up being um, trans transferable commodities that people then you know can extend past the experience or extend to other people who are then entering the experience. Yeah, I agree. I think it's about how do you use that asset to enhance the experience and not just have it you know anyone can sell an NFT or have it available. I think it's about how do you make it um, part of the experience and integral to the experience so it feels like it belongs there. We'll go back to the word authenticity, right? A guest will, in most of the time, is going to be able to smell right through something that is not authentic. 
So always be looking at everything that you're doing, you know, be it with NFTs, your merchandise selection, the actual experience, authenticity. Use that as one of your guiding principles. It's going to serve you right all the time. Well, again, thank you all very much. I want to thank my panelists, Stacy Moscatelli, Cecil McPurry, Susan Vargo, and Stacy Cohen. Uh, I managed to get through the whole panel with two Stacys on the panel without tripping up. So I'm feeling pretty darn good at the moment. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. We hope you found this informative and uh, have a great rest of the show.